unfortunately, with what's been going on in Victoria, we're now right back to very intense activities. This is very much a fight on the home front. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The only thing I was scared of was failing, with letting down the people there that I was supposed to support. Things went south really bad. You've got to have an element of crazy to be good at what we do. There was an ego attached to being a gun fighter. Being around big, tall trees, thick shrubbery, potentially connects him to other moments in his life during battle. It's not easy to get out field, not knowing when your legs are going to get blown off. You know you're a part of this fight. The story of transformation is powerful. Lieutenant General John Fruin, DSC, AM, is currently serving in the Australian Army. He is leading the COVID-19 task force established by Defence to coordinate the ADF's contribution to the whole of government response to the pandemic. I spoke to John over Zoom. He was in the office in Canberra, so there is some background noise and alarms from time to time. We chatted about some highlights of his military career to date, and in particular to get more of an insight into the work our servicemen and women are doing in response to COVID when the front line is at home. John, welcome to Life on the Line. Thanks, Alex. Great to be with you. The focus of our chat today, John, will be on the COVID-19 task force. But first, I was hoping to cover a few of your career highlights so far. Let's kick off with the fact that your father and grandfather also served in the Australian Army. Were they your inspiration to join up? Well, Alex, it's actually, uh, I think, a little known fact that I was more interested in going to the Air Force when I was at school. And I was struggling with the, uh, the maths requirements to become a pilot when the Army recruiters turned up at the school and they sort of got in touch with me and asked me if I'd be interested in applying for Dunfroon and uh, I spoke to my parents and they thought that would be a good experience just in terms of doing interviews and things and then lo and behold, I suddenly in year 11 had a scholarship to go to Dunfroon and my course was set but I was certainly imbued with the history and the traditions of the Army through my both father and grandfather. Uh, I also had a maternal great-grandfather who served in the Boer War as well so Army DNA does run sort of long back in our family and uh, my grandfather was a Warren Officer Class 1. My dad was a major uh, and I've made it to the Lieutenant General, so I think we're on a positive trajectory there. You graduate from the Royal Military College Duntroon in 1986 and are initially posted to be an Infantry Platoon Commander in 1RAR. In the 1990s, we start seeing the ADF deployed in humanitarian and peacekeeping missions. Were you deployed to Somalia or Rwanda during that decade? So I uh, left 1RAR, the 1st Battalion, just before they went to Somalia. And of course, we were in the long peace post-Vietnam there. Uh, None of us knew whether we would ever deploy on operation and had no inkling that we would enter this period, extraordinary period that we've been in with constant operations ever since. So I was uh, quite despondent. I was trying to get back into 1RR to see if I could get added on to the uh, the Somalia trip, like many of my compadres. And I told my father, who was a Vietnam veteran, my one opportunity to deploy had been missed and my life was over. And, And he said, look, when I was your age, I ended up in a place that I'd never even heard of. And I looked at him quizzically and said, what? Vietnam and he said in 1966 I had never heard of Vietnam. I said oh well it's a ridiculous story the world's a much smaller place now but within six months I found myself in Rwanda and I had not heard of Rwanda before either so the more things changed the more they stayed the same. That uh, trip to Rwanda I was on the advance party and the first rotation and we encountered some very sort of harrowing circumstances so it was a very formative experience for me and all of us who were on that trip. I've got a very tight group of friends from that operation. We get together sort of every year. We sort of look out for each other because many people from the Rwanda operation have sort of suffered terribly in years past. And uh, I don't know if you're aware, but just earlier this year, in February, after 25 years since the operation, we were awarded the Meritorious Unit Citation, which I think was uh, sort of overdue, but fantastic recognition of the, the really tremendous work that was done by everybody who, who deployed to that sort of you know, country that was absolutely being sort of torn apart at the time. So yeah, that's, uh, that was where my operational experience started, Alex. And we spoke earlier this year with Robin White, who was a nurse at the time who deployed to Rwanda in that mm. first rotation and shared with us, yes, as well, her recollection of in February going to Canberra for that citation, as well as the 
strong impression that country and that experience has made and the vital work you were doing with the people there just to help them in a humanitarian way out of some of those real dark times. Yeah, there were things that I learned on that operation too that have shaped my approach to leadership throughout, you know, being a, a relatively young captain at the time and dealing with, you know, soldiers in very complex circumstances and dealing with very difficult circumstances. It was a, despite the terrible part of it, it was a very fortunate experience because, uh, you know, I certainly have applied lessons from that mission throughout all the missions that I've, I've been on since. And seeing how the lessons you acquire in leadership accrues over time is an interesting theme I want to touch on as we progress through your career today. At the turn of the century, the world experiences what one would think would be a a once-in-a-generation global changing event, September 11. What are your memories of that day? And as a career officer by that time, I imagine you could appreciate just how much things were going to change. Even if you didn't know the direction, it was without a doubt a big my career is going to change, my life is going to change moment. I was enjoying uh, one of many of my career highlights at that stage. I was on exchange with the US Army in Hawaii for two years and I had a very good routine where I would go surfing very early in the morning before work. The car was all loaded. I got up early, checked the weather as I did, and suddenly there were all sorts of notifications to contact the embassy immediately in DC because the events of September 11 happened in the middle of the night in Hawaii, whereas others you know, in Australia had been watching it on TV. And, and the likes. So I, I had no idea what was going on. Then I turned on the TV and then saw what was going on, phoned the embassy, told them we were okay made the uh, hard decision to not partake of the perfect surf conditions that morning and reported straight to work. And then we were pretty much put into lockdown for a month. And the headquarters that I was with, the headquarters of US Army Pacific, were given the lead for the defence of Hawaii. There's some very strategic facilities in Hawaii. So again, an amazing opportunity to have a, as I was a strategic planner, to look at this very uh, expansive problem of how do you protect all of the facilities in Hawaii with the limited assets and all that sort of stuff. We, of course, had no idea whether that attack was just the first of a series of attacks. I mean, I had the view that if they were able to pull that attack off, there would probably be some follow-on attacks. Fortunately, that wasn't the case, but we had no idea that decades later that the war on terror would still be going. You know, I found myself, uh, I did a tour in Afghanistan in 2007, then when I was back 2017 as the commander of the Middle East, I, it was a strange experience to return to Afghanistan and think I was here 10 years ago doing very similar things and still facing very similar sort of challenges to the then next generation of folks that were in there doing those things. So, yeah, no, uh, an absolute seminal event in our lifetime and still playing out in many ways. And I can only imagine being on exchange with Americans and in sovereign US territory when that attack occurred. It would have been an even more emotionally raw state and members of their defence force you were surrounded with at the time. Yeah, I think uh, some of us forget just how personally they took it. It was an attack on you know, absolute symbols of their homeland. And, you know, there was a lot of anger. There was a lot of determination to get to the bottom of what had happened and to bring people to justice. And, you know, those early days were quite extraordinary times. And we were really concerned about waves of similar style attacks. So there was a very real security concern. And you know, there's a lot of military facilities and uh, important military equipment in Hawaii. So, it was a very real thing for us at the time. A couple of years later, in 2003, you're a lieutenant colonel and the initial international force commander for the Solomon Islands crisis. At its peak, you had 1,900 personnel and various naval vessels and aircraft under your command. That was a significant command. What did you learn from that experience as a leader? Yeah, so this was another amazing experience. I was a, in my first year of commanding an infantry battalion, which was my greatest aspiration to think that I might one day have the opportunity to command an Australian infantry battalion. Uh, we were the online battalion, which was the, the rapid response battalion. We were looking at events unfolding in Iraq at the time. We thought maybe there might be some rapid response role for us, either in the early stages of the conflict that was unfolding there in Iraq. We were looking at regional contingencies at the time, but we weren't really sure what was going to play out. As it happened, we did end up pushing one of our companies out into Iraq as the very first security force in Baghdad. We did that at short notice. And then shortly thereafter, a large slab of the battalion with me at the head of the what was a coalition joint task force were pushed into the Solomons at very short notice and uh, the government policy had turned 180 degrees from a more non-interventionist mindset about the Pacific to absolutely leading in and again this was linked to the war on terror. A few people know that we share air and sea boundaries, borders with the Solomon Islands. 
There was a lot of criminal elements and other elements, you know, potentially moving into sort of the chaos that was taking shape in the Solomon Islands. So there was also a very, potentially very direct threat to Australia. You know, if people were able to, you know, perhaps seize an aircraft in the Solomons, that they could fly directly into Brisbane uh, without much sort of warning or notice as well. So there was Australian national interest in there as well as a genuine humanitarian concern for what was going on in the Solomon Islands. Regional Citizens Mission to the Solomon Islands was known as Ramsey. That was a model of regional intervention. It was the first time a force had been integrated fully. Public servants, people from DFAT, the military, federal police, there were aid agencies all integrated before we got onto the job. It was the first time. And more typically what would happen is the military are deployed, the military stabilised, then others come. Well, we all hit the ground at exactly the same time. For pretty junior lieutenant colonel, I had troops from five different nations, Papua New Guineans, Fijians, Tongans, Kiwis and Australians all working uh, closely together. Of course, the three services, Army, Navy and Air Force uh, from the Kiwis. We had both uh, Kiwi Army and Kiwi Air Force in there as well. The Tongans were actually uh, Tongan Marines. So, you know, it was a picture of one of these uh, very complex forces that needed to be integrated. What was really fabulous about this as a command experience was most of the command opportunities that we have had in recent times have been operating as part of a much bigger organisation, a much bigger task force, a much bigger coalition headquarters. Uh, You know, I had autonomous command in the Solomons. It went from me working closely with the special coordinator, Nick Warner, and the the head of the AFP contingent, Ben McDevitt, but then I answered straight back into strategic command in Australia. And there was no way of telling how things would play out on the ground. It was uh, very much a pure, we were planning, we were depending on intelligence, we were working with the local population and we were fortunately very popular with the local population. We stayed very popular, but there were a whole range of different, you know, warlords and um, militias and all sorts of very, potentially very dangerous groups that we were both negotiating with and trying to sort of back into surrender effectively and to hand over their weapons. There was one particular fellow, Howard Kecky, who was the most notorious of the warlords down on the very remote weather coast of the Solomon Islands. We eventually got to have a meeting with him and then over a couple of interactions we uh, convinced him to come into custody for his organisation to surrender their weapons and from that moment the others all fell into line and the, and the country sort of turned on a dime but there were times with Keki where you know we were really concerned that we were going to end up in some sort of protracted struggle in the jungles down there that could have been you know very costly and very difficult but we got through that mission it was more in my the four months that I was there we had over three and a half thousand very dangerous military weapons sort of handed in or confiscated. We had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of uh, rounds of ammunition came into our possession. You know, we took a, a small war off the streets in the Solomons and we did it without one shot being fired in anger. So, you know, a remarkable mission, great success, uh, you know, testimony to the fantastic work from all of the people from those nations involved and from the military and the police and the diplomats all and the aid agencies working together. So, yeah, remarkable experience and fortunately one that went well. Absolutely. And I think the Solomons can wrongly be left out of the conversation a bit sometimes because there's clearly a lot of dynamic components at play there. You're describing what you're having to deal with as well as that, not just the humanitarian mission component, but the security war on terror aspect as well that you're shoring up at the time. And as a emerging leader at Junior Lieutenant Colonel, that's also a great theatre to cut your teeth in. It's not as kinetic as engagements in the Middle East, say, but also you have that autonomy you describe. So you're not having to liaise with multiple bodies. You can really just take charge and own the situation. The resources that were given to us were spot on. We had a frigate, the Manura. So the Manura had seeking helicopters, heavy sort of lift helicopters that could punch through the really terrible weather, uh, particularly on places like the weather coast and over some of the, the high mountain ranges in the Solomons. That was a real jewel in the crown. We had a range of other ships at our disposals, right down to patrol boats that could get in and out of some of these um, smaller places surrounded by atolls and the like. We had Iroquois helicopters from both Australia and New Zealand. We had caribou aircraft that were doing exactly what they had been designed to do, landing on and taking off on very short jungle strips in tough weather conditions. We had people living in very, very remote jungle or island locations and villages. Uh, It was an amazing experience. Before we move on, I should note that you were given an AM as part of the Queen's 2004 birthday honours for, I quote, exceptional performance during operations for your work in the Solomons. And then we jump ahead to 2007, is that your first time in Afghanistan? Yeah, I had visited when I was the military assistant of the Chief of the Army and I visited a couple of times with him. 
we had a special operations task group who were, you know, one of the very first elements in there. So I had been to the place and I had a feel for the place, but it was the first time that I had, uh, had sort of lived there and experienced the operating environment firsthand. And what was your role in that deployment in 07? I started off as a, I was the national commander, full colonel then, and I was based out of Kabul. And then during the course of that deployment, 2007 at that stage was the most sort of violent year of the conflict and the conflict was expanding. We increased the rank of the national commander there to brigadier, a one star came in and then I was freed up from that role and I was moved down into the south into Kandahar and I was embedded into the headquarters of the command of headquarters regional south and given what was a new job then helping expand the Afghan army, both training the Afghan army and the Afghan national police. You commented earlier how you then found yourself in 2017 there and looking back going 10 years on and we're still here. So let's get to that grappling with that sort of realization of what a long war we found ourselves in. Along the way to that 2017 role, you had various senior staff appointments over the years, as covered some of these military assistant to the chief of army, chief of staff headquarters, forces command, and had military strategic commitments in Australian defense headquarters. And operationally, you were the commander of Joint Task Force 633 in 2017, responsible for Australian forces in the Middle East for operations Okra and High Road. What were some of the highlights you experienced while in that role, personally, on behalf of the task force? And let's circle back to that reflection of, I was here 10 years ago, here we still are. You know, opportunities for command at a senior officer level at that stage, most general level, are, are pretty rare. So it was a great honour to, again, be given the opportunity to command men and women of the ADF. Task Force 633 in the Middle East, again, not a lot of people realise the broad expanse of that command. At that stage, we had ADF men and women in Iraq, Afghanistan, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, Jordan, the UAE. We were, you know, way across the Middle East. Uh, and we also had people that weren't directly under my command, but we had a sort of logistics relationship with in the Sinai and in South Sudan. So a lot of travel in and out of Iraq and Afghanistan, but visiting many of these other countries at a time when we all had a very clear common concern, which was both oh, the remnants of Al-Qaeda, but uh, really at that time, Daesh. And that sort of bound us all, gave us all a you know, very clear focus. Uh, so that was, again, culturally, uh, you know, spending a lot of time, particularly with Arab cultures, getting back to Afghanistan, again, being with the Afghans again was great. I was very fortunate. My command, Warren Officer, it was a 12-month deployment. For that whole 12 months, I had an Air Force Warrant Officer, Ken Robertson, who was a great fellow. We got on really well. So, you know, and had a great team in the headquarters there as well. You know, it was a really great working environment, really great team environment. The real highlights from that year in Iraq, the standout was the battle for Mosul was on. And I came in when they were sort of halfway through the fight for East Mosul and then... Um, that transition, there was a bit of a lull and then it sort of pushed into the other side of Mosul. But, you know, this was Stalingrad-type operations. We had our special operations task group who were mentoring and working very closely with the Iraqi counterterrorism service who were the elite sort of formation in Iraq at the time. Great working relationship, but, you know, getting up close to Mosul and seeing those people, you know, planning and conducting operations day in, day out, taking casualties day in, day out, a really remarkable experience. And to see the coalition machine from intelligence to air support, you know, right down to troops on the ground in action in those difficult combat circumstances, that was uh, that was sort of a bringing together of a, a lifetime of military service and uh, into seeing it at some of its worst. You know, meanwhile, over in Afghanistan, yes, it was a bit strange to get back there and to hear people talking about the latest five-year plan. That sadly is very reminiscent of the uh, latest five-year plan that was being put together a decade ago and you had to bite your tongue a little bit because uh, a fresh set of eyes on a, an enduring problem had sort of come up with, in some cases, you know, the same sorts of approaches that we were trying. And really, for me, Afghanistan has always been, you know, primarily it's a law and order problem. I mean, I learned a lot in the Solomons about working closely with police and, uh, you know, the way police are very different. And my tour in Afghanistan in 2007, it was so, I was so fortunate to have had the experience in the Solomons when suddenly I'm working with Afghan police that, you know, I had a really good understanding of what police can be, should be, and how to operate effectively with military, whereas many of the people who had been thrown on the support to the Afghan police task came with a military mindset, had never really worked with police, and they were 
tending to turn the police into yet another military-style force or paramilitary, and they were losing sight of some of the really important roles police have just around, you know, gathering of evidence, enforcing law, all of those sorts of things, whereas if there was more of that in Afghanistan throughout the last couple of decades, I think that would have moved us to a more normalised society. Fast it may be, but that's, you know, simply my opinion. The other thing that was going on in the Middle East too is we had a ship that was operating with the Coalition Maritime Force, and we still do, out of uh, Bahrain. They were involved in, and we had a couple of ships through there in the time. Uh, Newcastle was there at one stage and uh, Warramunga was there. Through the 12 months, there is a monsoon season where the operating environment is very difficult. Then there are other periods where those maritime operations, it's more conducive for those sorts of operations. But they were really involved in interdicting contraband that was being used to fund some of these terrorist organisations across places like Iraq and Afghanistan. Warramunga, I'll mention because... They were under my direct command. I used to love getting out to see the ship. It was at the helm of the ship when they went through the Straits of Hormuz at one stage, you know, with the, the sort of interactions going on with the Iranians. And that's the everyday operating environment for them. A lot of people, again, don't know about it, but it's a very tense and difficult circumstances. But Warramunga, in her tour out there, in the months she was out there, she took you know, almost two tonnes of heroin, almost 32 tonnes of hashish. It was $2.2 billion worth of drugs that that ship and her crew seized, and that's $2.2 billion worth of cash that didn't find its way into the hands of terrorist organisations, you know, notwithstanding the sort of the sheer misery that the, those drugs potentially caused on the streets of places various as well. That is command of 633. You are one day with troops engaged in tough urban fighting, another day with troops doing uh, counterinsurgency operations in a place that has been troubled by uh, those sorts of conflicts for centuries. Next day, you're on a ship out in the middle of the Arabian Gulf somewhere, watching them destroy millions of dollars worth of drugs. Remarkable, remarkable experience. Very uh, fortunate and, again, great honour to be put in command of those men and women. The ADF do all these remarkable things day in, day out, uh, including the Air Force. And I forgot the Air Force. Now, the Air Force, we had the F-18s were still with us there doing strike operations all the way up into northern Iraq, uh, into Syria at the time. And the workhorses of 633, the C-130 aircraft, day in, day out, flying all over the theatre, in and out of places where, you know, times they were being shot at. The tankers, the command and control aircraft, you know, nothing but the utmost admiration for, you know, the Air Force and the capability they just deliver day in, day out. I appreciate that really in-depth answer on what 633 does, John, because it is a huge gamut, as you've just described there. Say, touching on the drugs first, I know from speaking with, say, Navy veterans that pretty much this whole century in the Arabian Gulf, when we've had ships there, there's been interceptions of drug operations and they're trying to stem that flow and that terrorist funding or second commander regiment veterans telling me about when they've teamed up with American operations on the ground in Afghanistan, again, to stem the drug trade there to try and cut off Taliban and Al-Qaeda's source of funding there, as well as, of course, the humanitarian aspect. And you're dealing with that sort of form of policing in one sense. And then on the other day of the week, you're watching Battle of Mosul, which you likened it to Stalingrad. And I think that's a very fair comment because that kind of scale of urban fighting, that density and intensity, we've not seen that in a long time. And for Australian soldiers to be involved in that, it's a really remarkable moment of our modern warfare era. Yeah, look, you know, massive rubbleized areas, ancient, narrow laneways and streets, the full weight of modern air power being brought to bear. Daesh remarkably, day after day, turning up with improvised armoured vehicles packed with explosives that would come hammering out of nowhere down streets into the flanks of Iraqi formations. UAVs being brought into play by the enemy, UAVs that were dropping munitions, the whole concept of air superiority being brought in the challenge it was warfare at some of its most brutal and complicated and we don't need to get into an actual political discussion but it is an interesting contrast you've highlighted there in your long career you have seen a range of policies and some repeat policies implemented in the middle east and you get that long-term perspective on it whereas when policy has been formed it's by one government and even in between that 07 to 17 period there's what five prime ministerial changes changing from one party of politics to the other and then back again and so there's that short-term fresh eye perspective on bringing a solution to a problem or a new policy to try and counter an issue and then you've had this perspective of looking at going, yep, done that before, here we go again. <laughs> All these operations are unique in their own ways, but there is there's common themes that run through the middle of them. And I mean, there's humans all through them and there is soldiers, sailors and men and women who have to respond to these things. So it's, it's a human endeavour at its heart. 
We're going to jump ahead to 2020, John, but once again, I should acknowledge that you were appropriately recognised for your command of Australian forces on overseas operations, this time a Distinguished Service Cross for, I quote, Distinguished Command and Leadership in Warlike Operations. So now we come forward to 2020. The Australian public has seen more than once the Defence Force be utilised on the home front to assist in emergencies, typically in disaster relief like floods and fires, and our most recent devastating summer bushfires being a very memorable example of that. Responding to a global pandemic, that's a new one. Talk me through when you first had that meeting or phone call to say, we've got a new task force for you to lead. So I don't know if you're aware, but at that stage I was in the Australian Signals Directorate as the Principal Deputy Director General over there. You never quite know where your military career is going to take you. I hadn't foreseen uh, time with ASD, which was just fantastic, an amazing organisation. But very quickly, uh, I went from the world of computer viruses to actual viruses. <laughs> and when the Secretary of Defence, Greg Moriarty, phoned me and said that uh, he and the CDF had formed a view that this COVID thing could get out of hand quickly and we would need to uh, pull together a proper coordination of it in the department and asked whether I would take the job. We had no idea whether it would last a month, whether it would last a year. You know, there's been times through this where we thought we were sort of over it. Now I would say I think it's going to be at least a year. But again, uh, I thought three-star general level, uh, command of a sort, might have sort of passed me by. But here we are. We are now, again, not only working um, with men and women from the ADF, but very closely with our public service colleagues, with our defence industry, uh, contractor colleagues. This is a full enterprise effort to fight, to respond to this you know, really uh, intense challenge. The early weeks and months of my involvement with the COVID task force were, were as intense as anything I've done before. We were working extremely long hours. Then we had a couple of months of relative calm where it looked like things were probably starting to scale the task force down and we were looking at when we might sort of wrap up operations. But then, unfortunately, with what's been going on in Victoria, we're now right back to very intense activities. We've got people entire breadth to the countryside. And what is unique about the approach to this thing is not just it's the first time that we've had sort of a three-star lead on a task force like this, but I've got two deputies. I've got a military deputy, a Major General, who really is focused on the military sort of support stuff. And at the moment, that's uh, Major General Paul Kenny, who will, at the end of the year, transition to become the new Commander of Special Operations Command. Announced this morning, yep. Yep. And then my uh, civilian lead is a lady called Megan Lees, a very capable public servant. And she's been heading up all of the stuff to do with departmental policies and communications. She's got a particular strong suit on understanding some of the whole government space and particularly ministerial officers and those sorts of things. She was formerly a chief of staff to Defence Minister, Mr Payne had that role. That's indicative of this is a fully integrated defence enterprise effort and we've been having to make sure that the whole defence enterprise is postured to continue with defence business and we have then also had to coordinate all of the types of defence responses back out into the whole government space. Like any of these defence operations, it's a full team effort, ADF, APS, I mentioned contractors, but families as well. This is very much a fight on the home front. There is no hiding from this. So, you know, we've also had to make sure that everybody is very clear about what's going on, what we're doing, how they can stay safe and the like. Obviously, it's a very serious situation. The phrase unprecedented gets thrown around a lot. It's become a cliche, but it is true. And we're putting serious resourcing behind it, indicative of the fact we have a three-star leading this task force with a senior public servant and a two-star as deputies. We're recording on Friday, 7 August, and I mentioned the date just because it is changing constantly, the situation. So I need to put that historical marker there. As we record, what are the main tasks our personnel are performing across the states and territories, the on-the-ground realities they're dealing with? Yeah, so look, in the early months of this, we had the high water mark was about 2,200, mainly ADF people scattered across the states and territories. It did include 200 public servants who, again, for the first time, we sent 200 defence public servants to Services Australia to help them with the call centres that were being used for, at that stage, people making claims and that sort of stuff. So a little example there of unique whole of government, all hands to the pump. It's not just about the ADF. This was the APS uh, writ large coming not only out of defence, but from all of the other government departments being sent down to uh, Services Australia to, to help man those call 
call centres that were absolutely essential to, to getting money out and around the countryside. Then that sort of scaled right back down. Today, as we speak, we have just crested over 3,400 people around the countryside. We are in every state and territory to some degrees. In some places, it is just a handful of people, planners, liaison sort of staff. In Victoria right now, we have got more than 1,600 people. We have got people manning border checkpoints. We are in airports helping marshal people from planes to buses and onto hotels. We have got people in hotels doing quarantine assurance. We have got people in call centres working uh, either on contact tracing or working with police doing uh, quarantine assurance sort of work. We have got people out on the streets, most prominently down in Melbourne, whether they are with police or authorised officers of the Department of Health and Human Services there. We have got people in cities, we have got people in regional towns, we have got people in outback locations, we have got people on testing stations, we have got people doing logistics, whether it's by air or road, we have got defence contractors uh, engaged in the ongoing services, we have had people working in mass production factories, both helping out, repairing machines, redesigning production line processes to turn operations from five days a week into sort of seven days around the clock type operations and massively ramping up national capability. Uh, it's um, quite remarkable the scope and scale of what we are doing. It's been nothing but uh, remarkable to watch the men and women of the ADF and our very dedicated public service just turn their hand to whatever the latest crisis is and to just move out on the tasks that you know none of us ever expected that we would uh, we would be doing in the sort of circumstances that we are and again on home soil in all sorts of corners of Australia. The training of the men and women of the Australian Defence Force is world class yet you're having to send out troops to do tasks that are not in the training manual shall I say. It shows really the resilience of our troops that they're able to just be thrown this curveball and they just have to pick it up, run with it, work hand in glove with local authorities. It's remarkable. Yeah, well, I mean, look, we, we've got very clear selection processes, so we do attract a certain type of people. And again, I've not seen anything but the highest quality people who are attracted to defence public service. But, you know, in the military side of the house, we instil in the training problem solving, flexibility, efficiencies in whatever you are doing. And this is what just plays out in times like this. We are planners. Planning is in our DNA. We are problem solvers. That is in our DNA. And People are genuinely committed to getting whatever job they are given done. And it's just a bonus when it's being able to help out, help someone in need. But in this case, you know, to help out our fellow sort of citizens who are, you know, in all sorts of uh, desperate need and uh, or in threat of contracting this disease across the country. So. The severity of the pandemic is varying greatly by state and territory and each have different restrictions in place and regulations and legislation can change quickly depending on how those statistics are looking at the local level. I imagine it's quite complex to coordinate all those different levels of response. Yeah, so look, each of the states and territories have had a slightly different approach to this. Some of the, the way they are structured to deal with crisis is different. Their local politics is always different. The way the pandemic has hit them is different. The threats can be quite different. You know, in some of the states, we've got these remote Indigenous communities that have been of particular concern to us throughout. So really, uh, you know, we've I've talked about flexibility, but this is really about providing support. We are not seeking to take charge, to be in the lead. It's like during the bushfires. We weren't doing the bushfire fighting per se. There were professional firefighters to do that, but we worked to provide every other type of support that we possibly could to make sure that the firefighters were focused on nothing but fighting fire. And this is very much the same case. We have turned up with the emergency services or the crisis coordination response elements in all of the states and territories and said, here we are. Uh, we can help you plan. We can help you understand what we can do and what we can't do and where we might be able to help. But it's up to the states and territories then to request the help. That gets prioritised through the emergency management coordinators and emergency management Australia. And if it's deemed that it's a priority and there is absolutely no one else that can do it, then the request comes to us. And in the overwhelming majority of those cases, we you know, approve the support and then we get onto it as fast as we can. You know, coming into this in the early months, national policies were changing daily, if not hourly. It was exhausting from a civilian perspective. I can't imagine. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was. And, uh, you know, and we were just letting the ink dry on our new policy that had only been developed two days prior. And then I'd look up and see the PM on the screen and I would tear that document up and we would go back to the drawing board and make another policy that would catch up. 
Then we went into sort of steady state for a long period, but we are back in that sort of place again now. Things are changing rapidly again. So it's a process of, you know, consultation, working with the states and territories, you know, establishing the relationships, setting policies, you know, getting the communications out. You know, we've certainly, uh, many of us have learnt a lot about our nation. You know, even Paul Kenny was reflecting. He, he was heading up the task force out of Sydney doing all the tactical implementation before he came to Canberra to act as my deputy. But he was out in some of these remote locations and said, you know, he was even just learning things about Indigenous communities that sit astride state borders and how they interact and all sorts of things about nitty-gritty of day-to-day life and state and territory legislations and all these sorts of things. It's been fascinating to, to learn all of that sort of stuff. Throughout, we have sought to ourselves be exemplars of government policy, uh, exemplars of best practice, COVID safe. We are always sort of tough on ourselves uh, in terms of standards and those sorts of things. But, you know, it's been really important that for us that we a part of the solution and not part of the problem by becoming a disease vector ourselves, that we haven't become a burden on the public health system. When you see men and women of the ADF on the TV screens, that they are wearing their protective equipment properly and all of that sort of stuff that people look to us as, you know, that dependable, reliable organisation that we are fortunate enough to enjoy a, a reputation for. We've talked about our troops trained to be problem solvers, to be adaptable, to be resilient in any scenario. And still, it must be a challenge for our personnel on the ground doing that work on a personal level because they are, yes, operating on home soil, unprecedented, all that. And it's emotionally volatile times too. They are at risk from this. They are doing work that exposes them directly to it, despite the precautions they may take, and it puts their families at risk too. Yeah, I mean, the ADF are designed to operate in high-threat environments. We train for for combat environments. So you mentioned earlier that none of us expected to be doing pandemic response, but the threat is very real. This is a tough enemy. It's invisible. It's pervasive. It's touching every single corner of our nation, our economy. And that's the same sort of globally. There's been a couple of levels of the, the threat here. We've got individuals who are out you know, engaging the community. We've got people working on testing stations. We've now got people working in aged care facilities in Victoria, which are the, one of the highest priorities down there. And there's been some very sort of challenging you know, circumstances they've found themselves in. So there has been threat of infection to all of the people on tasking out in the public. But, of course, this plays very heavily on the friends and families as well. Families have been very concerned about them. There has been, not so much recently, but in the early days of this, when people had gone positive, there was a real stigma around that and people were finding themselves, you know, in some circumstances being ostracised. So there were issues around managing of families in that environment. But again, this is just, for us, another threat environment. You break down the threat, you put in place the mitigation measures and you continue to operate. It's exactly the same as you do in war zones. It's exactly the same as you do on peacekeeping operations. So, you know, we've got the right equipment, we've got the right training and uh, you need the right leadership to just make sure that is put in place and and stuck to and so there are I think men and women doing quite brave things persisting despite the threat. Different environment, same military, same policies, same approach to a problem. Mm. I live in Sydney and I know New South Wales was an early adopter of using the ADF to help enforce say hotel quarantine for those arriving from overseas. In managing the first wave, particularly in March and April, how effective do you think it was having that military presence to assist and augment the police and health department agencies? Yeah, look, um, I mentioned some states and territories, you know, they've got the lead on this. And in many cases, they, you know, had the capacities they needed. So they didn't need to reach out to the ADF. Others very quickly reached out to the ADF. I've mentioned, you know, we enjoy overwhelmingly positive reputation with most of uh, our nation, but you've got to protect that. But, you know, this, again, we, we keep hitting the themes of this is a supporting role and we are here to help and we are not here to take charge. So we constantly reinforce that. Now, where the ADF has turned up, The feedback has always been very good that people find it very reassuring. Uh, In a couple of the tasks, though, we have started to to fringe up against law enforcement and compliance type things. So we've also been really careful to make it crystal clear that at no time do we have or have we sought anything that resembles law enforcement powers or coercive powers. And it has always been the police that have done that. And we have operated in support of the police, just providing logistics or back of house type stuff that has meant that the police could sort of conduct their operations more broadly than they otherwise would have been able to with some of that maybe backup support. Similarly, if you see, uh, you know, checkpoints and roadblocks, it's the police that are checking people's credentials and issuing whatever sort of measures that are being put in place to 
enforced compliance, not the ADF. That's something that we've been very conscious of as well. It's always great when you you know you hear people sort of saying how pleased they are that the ADF are on the job, and uh, or there are lots of areas that are asking us to send the ADF because they would like to have them around. And it's not just because uh, you know I think that we're typically you know pretty efficient at whatever we turn our minds to, but you know the men and women of the ADF do have a genuine compassion for people as well. We really encourage them to to interact with the communities in respectful ways. They enjoy doing it, they're good at it, and people you know, respond well to it. I think it's been well communicated, not just in this chat, but right from the start, how that separation of powers has worked and the ADF is a supplementary force being there to augment and assist the authorities whose day-to-day job it is to do that. And that's a comforting distinction, but also on a personal level, I was really glad to see the ADF involved in Sydney and ensuring that stability of, say, the hotel quarantine and ensuring that quality control and that success. And that was something that worked really well here. But I think you've needed to communicate that clarity of differentiation of roles because it's still not something the public is, say, used to. Say in Victoria, where the current situation is much worse, I know the ADF are assisting, as you've mentioned previously, with the contact tracing, which means if someone doesn't answer the phone in time, they may well get an ADF member knocking on their door or it might be a police officer and they've got an ADF member over their shoulder. For some people, that will be confronting. Others will find it comforting to see military uniforms on the street helping to keep order, absolutely. But for some, it will be alarming. How have you briefed your soldiers to interact with the public? We are of the community. For COVID, it's been a requirement that the troops that we've put onto task have had to come from inside the state borders. So not only are we Australians and Australian citizens, but very literally people have been operating very closely with the communities they are, are from. That's great in terms of you know, people being able to provide an immediate impact to people that are close to them or communities that are close to them. I've mentioned we have sought to be exemplars in the COVID space. We're very protectful of that. We always are respectful. We're always professional. We're always compassionate. Fortunately, you don't need to sort of keep hitting those themes. You do need to just make sure we are on our game in terms of being exemplars of the right behaviours in relation to COVID and we've got the right training and the right equipment and all that's being put in place. But I find the the ADF like ducks to water when it comes to being respectful and compassionate and they impress and make you proud and they're our best ambassadors when it comes to this sort of stuff. They absolutely are, and I have great respect for the challenges they are facing up to. We've seen news reports of, say, police officers being assaulted by members of the public when asked to engage with particular regulations in the local area. I'm thinking of, say, in Victoria, and that's an on-the-ground reality they're dealing with, and it's not just the cops that are dealing with that. It is the Defence Force, so I just have a personal thank you to every man and woman in uniform out there right now doing that job. There are a lot of obvious differences, John, between leading the COVID-19 task force and your previous operational commands overseas. If we look back at your work in the Solomon Islands and commanding forces in Afghanistan, Iraq, what's the most fundamental difference between those and your current role as a leader? So look, this is strategic leadership. Solomon's was very much tactical leadership, but it touched very closely on the operational strategic level. Command in the Middle East, again, very much at the sort of operational level, touching on the strategic, but not as closely, strangely enough, as it was from the Solomons. But this is very much about strategic leadership. Uh, you know, I mentioned this is a new model. It's a fully integrated model, military, civilian deputies, and we've got military and civilians all through the, the task force structure. We've also got an industry cell, which is something that we didn't have initially, but We realise the requirement for it and that industry cell has been a a unique and a very essential part of this as well. But what strategic leadership really is about is Prime Minister, the Ministers, it's that sort of level. And then the whole of government space where you are working with a whole range of agencies and other actors and it's about collaboration and understanding cultures and language and using contacts effectively That's the sort of day-to-day working space. And then from that, you have to deliver clear guidance and clear communications down to those who are executing the tasks. But, you know, it's a different style of existence as a commander than it is when you are, you know, locked in a 24-hour cycle of planning. The other thing that's been really untypical, if not unique, about COVID is because of the restrictions on travel and the inability to cross borders and the the ways that we have had to approach uh, mitigation of risk, you know, this isn't a getting out and about and seeing men and women doing the tasks in the traditional way. 
And I mentioned Paul Kenny. When Paul Kenny was in Sydney running the tactical task force down there, the first couple of months of that was almost solely done remotely, like this, talking to commanders through a Zoom screen or a phone line or whatever, and not being there and in our typical military operations, and particularly in combat operations, that face-to-face command engagement, that battlefield circulation is an absolute central part of what you need to do as a commander. And that job in the Middle East, even in 2017, you know, I spent probably at least half of my time on the road, getting around, seeing people, seeing firsthand what they're doing and getting that sense of, is the local command climate right? Does it feel right, smell right sort of thing? really important. We haven't been able to do that as much with COVID. There was a period then when things freed up a bit and we were able to start to get out and about and see folks, which is always a real pleasure to see them doing the job and to, and to share some of their sense of pride in what they're doing. This has been very, uh, very different in that regard. John, if the civilian listeners of this show have one key takeaway from our interview today about the COVID-19 task force and Operation COVID-19 Assist, what would you want it to be? You said unprecedented, but you know this is a, one of these once-in-a-century events. The, the Spanish uh, influenza pandemic was pretty much 100 years ago, and here we are dealing with something that is new to us but is not new to history. There is no magic solution. There is no way to just make it go away. It has got a way to run. It's going to take patience and it's going to take discipline. You know, it is doing all manner of damage to our economy. We don't know how it will change some of our you know, social practices and work practices in a long time. This is a big deal. It's a really hard thing to deal with. Personally, I think we've done remarkably well both as you know, a one defence team in responding in our piece of it, but as a nation, I think uh, you know you don't need to look you know too far afield to see other societies that haven't reacted quite as effectively as the Australian public have. And there's been some great leadership at government level, great interactions between leadership at federal level and the state and territory level, and the you know adherence to medical advice and all of those sorts of things. But I do want to pass thanks to all of those folks that have worked with me here on the task force and continue to work with me here on the task force. We ticked over 150 days just uh, on Wednesday, I think it was. At the 100-day mark, we didn't think we would see 150 days. Well, at the 150-day mark, I think it's pretty sure we're going to see 200 days. But they've all been absolutely fantastic. I, you know, Absolute thanks uh, and appreciation for everything that the troops on task are doing all around the country. The patience and support of families, we really do appreciate. Uh, it's essential. And as always, that's been um, fundamental to our ability to, to go on. And the public, I do want to thank the public as well, because they're very good to the ADF, the men and women out on the streets. That positive feedback and encouragement from the general public has been great as well. And all of this, all of our individual actions matter in this thing. We all need to show discipline. Every single one of us can be key to continuing an outbreak or or getting the outbreak in check. So it just comes back to patience and discipline. We've got a a way to go. We need to look out for each other. We need to reach out to people who are doing it tough at whatever time. Right now, that's Victoria. You know, I've got my my mum is on her own down there in Victoria. We're sort of talking to her. My wife had a great idea the other day. We put a care package together and sent that down to her. But those sorts of things... I think they mean a lot to people, so I encourage everyone to do that. You know, on behalf of all of the defence people involved in COVID-19, you know, I will just let the Australian public know, and thank you, Alex, for this sort of medium to do that. But we are very pleased to be able to help. We are very pleased to be able to make a difference. That is the thing about service that is most important, is that being able to make a difference and being able to make a difference in tough times. So it's our absolute pleasure to be able to, to play a role in that. But we are but one part of a system that involves frontline health workers, emergency service workers, legislators, you know, all the way down the line where one cog in that big machine. It's an absolute pleasure for us to be able to play a meaningful part. Well, John, I know you are a very busy man, so I appreciate the generous amount of time you've given me this morning. Lieutenant General John Fruin, thank you for your ongoing service to our country and thank you to everyone involved in keeping our public safe and healthy. And thanks for coming on Life on the Line. Thanks, Alex. An absolute pleasure. It's been great talking with you. My enormous thanks go to Defence Media and Lieutenant General Fruin for the interview opportunity. We've interviewed another Joint Task Force 633 commander before. 
Don't miss Angus Horden's interview with a distinguished retired Major General in number 82, John Cantwell, Volume 1. Only to be uh, shot at and cut off and pushed into enemy territory and found myself on the wrong side of the enemy lines, surrounded by Iraqis in the middle of the night with a British tank organisation busily attacking them with me in the middle of it. Meanwhile, American helicopters were trying to shoot me with missiles. And Volume 2. There are ways to tackle this damn thing, this PTSD. And uh, it's important that people know that there are others who have been through something like that. Join us next Tuesday for Sharon Maskell Dare's conversation with the current commanding officer of JTF 633, with the Major General herself recorded in the Middle East, in number 86, Susan Coyle. You have to be resilient to be able to cope in any environment. For more on Rwanda, listen to the season two conversation recorded by Thomas Kay with an Air Vice Marshal. Number 33, Tracy Smart. I'm sorry, sister. Um, we weren't able to save her, so she just passed, you know, a little while ago. And the nun burst into tears. So I then had to counsel the nun. And this year, number 80, Robin White. There were lots of children that we looked after who'd been injured horrifically with landmines. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Life on the Line Podcast and on Twitter at LOTL Pod. Our website is www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions. Artwork by Big Cat Design. Music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thanks for listening, and lest we forget. <laughs>